So it can be done, and it can be done really, really successfully, which is a fantastic way of introducing Maddie McGowan from Cranfield University. So we're going to step over here, and we're going to have a look at the, um, the Cranfield rebrand. So Maddie, firstly, I'd love you to tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, and how you ended up at Cranfield. I'm just going to grab my mic. Thanks, Ollie. Um, can you hear me down there? Yeah? Uh, I'm Maddie McGowan. I started life really in the universities at Surrey, spent four years or so there. Then I went into a period of doing um, interim type work across a range of universities, which was a fantastic experience. Um, and I actually went to Cranfield to do a bit more of that because they had a new VC. He'd, he'd been there for about 12 months or so and had really big plans for the place. And I was brought in really as that change agent. That's great. So, buddy, I've promised to highlight three principles that we'd all do well to take away and learn from the disasters and the successes that I've already begun to talk about. So the next two questions, uh, or a few questions, let's say, are around principle one, the critical importance of internal engagement. I'd love you to tell us about Cranfield University at the point at which you joined it, and try and give us a brutally honest account of its health at that point. So shoot from the hips, Maddie. Okay, um, right. So Cranfield had a new VC, as I've said, and he had done a great job in pulling together a, a, an action plan, a five-year plan, um, there were four strategic priorities. It had been reorganised. We now had an executive board that we didn't have before. Um, but it had a very weak brand presence. It had been a very successful university going back 70 years. It's our 70th anniversary this year. But actually, it was a university that had thrived as a series of federations. It, it was a collection of small units that somehow hung together but actually drove their own ship. Um, there was no sense really of any coherent cross-university mechanism for making plans, for joining together and it's no wonder in my view really that they didn't have a particularly loud collective voice. Mm -hmm. What they did have was a huge amount of success in the fields that they were very successful at. So for example, the management school, which people may well have heard of, Cranfield University Management School, um, and in aerospace, and also our um, defense and security work down at Shrivenham with the MOD. Great, thank you. So, so the university is reshaping itself um, in terms of its strategy, levels of ambition, estate, senior team. Why did you believe, though, that um, a brand repositioning exercise might also bring something of value to the table at that moment? Because when I first got there and I realised that the ambitions were enormous, um, I think what we had to do was say, well, what's beyond the action plan? Mm. Where are we headed? What, what's the point of having such an action plan? And, and I realised there wasn't really a long-term vision at all for the kind of university institution we're going to be. Uh, were we going to be wholly postgraduate as we've remained? Were we going to be branching out into undergraduate work? Were we going to partner overseas? Nobody had really got a vision of what we were going to become one day. And I also realised, um, and we did some work on that visioning, and that was really quite exciting. If we had time, I'd tell you all about it. Um, but I think the other thing that dawned on myself and also the Vice Chancellor was that unless we did some sort of gathering together and ag agree what our agenda was and then express it collectively, we were never going to be speaking with one voice in the way we needed to do if we were going to be more than that sum of the parts. And a rebrand seemed inevitable at that stage. Mm. Great, that's really helpful. And I, I can vividly remember feeling like the conversation had well and truly begun when we landed as an agency as well. It was not like we were having to begin that conversation. Maddie had done some absolutely excellent groundwork, helping people to clarify exactly what the university was going to stand for going forward. Let me ask you, who owned the project? What was the sort of decision-making structure? That, and who was involved at what level? Because I'm interested in what levels of internal engagement took place. It was led by the Vice-Chancellor and myself, and that was absolutely crucial. Um, and we formed a steering group of the Chief, the Chief Operating Officer and also the um, Pro-Vice-Chancellor of the Management School. And we steered it all the way through. In fact, I think you were 
engaged by that group of people. So they were absolutely in on the ground floor and shepherded it all the way through. Um, And at various strategic points, they would take the recommendations that we were making to the exec board. But the other thing we did was had a sort of 80-strong consultation group across the whole university. Um, And that included a few alumni, actually, so students and staff. So it was a very wide constituency. We had to be a bit selective about how many questions we asked them, um, or we'd never make any progress. But actually, they were quite an important group. And your own Marcom's team as well, they were? Yeah. Yeah, very much part of this process. Very much so, yeah. So all sorts of different groups at different levels of the university were engaged throughout the process from day one. Um, One of the most important pieces of work that we did really early on was around brand architecture. I'm going to put, um, yeah, what we call the exploded sun diagram on screen. Can you tell us what this is and its significance to the project? Yeah, this is a cracking bit of um, theatre, really. Um, I managed to pull together with a lot of detective work all the brands and logos that we were actually using as a university at the time. I mean, given that we're not a massive university, you can see the absolute chaos that reigned. And it was a really vivid um, illustration of why we needed to join together, because obviously all our many, many customers across the world were sort of accessing the university through one or other of these brands and had no idea about the rest of them. There was no obvious connection between many of these at all. And um, yeah, it it was quite a sobering moment. It's becoming a bit of a work of art for us to have on the wall. And I think it convinced people, didn't it, that there was a really serious job of work to be done here, that we couldn't allow this to proliferate even further. And when you think that that diagram, the very fact that it is a diagram, it formalises what is even more chaotic than the diagram shows. So, And it's not an unusual picture. You, lots no. of institutions find themselves in this sort of a mess just by organic growth. Yeah, it has led us to ask lots of hard questions that we still continue to ask ourselves about, well, what bit of the university is that? Is that internal? Is that external? We've led, actually, this has led on to... Um, something called the Cranfield Group, because we have spin-outs and we have all sorts of companies who are affiliated with us, um, but naturally they're not part of the internal architecture. And and it's really helped us to have a bit of a mental discipline about how we bring new um, elements of the organisation into it and how we manage it going forward. And then I'm just going to put one more diagram on screen. So this um, may be worth just saying a little Mm -hmm. bit about your theme structure as a university so that people can make sense of this future state diagram. Yeah, we had um, already got a theme structure in place, meaning that all of our uh, full schools have two or three themes each. And that just means that we're market facing in terms of the sectors that we have work within. So we have, I'm trying to read them all now, we've got management, um, we've got defence and security, aerospace, water. So if you can see, yeah, we had eight of those and... Um, And that's it really. So we've organised ourselves around those and we took that as our starting point to ensure that we were going to market in a very theme focused way. That's great. So we're going to continue talking about internal engagement, but the next few questions are also around this principle too, about doing your homework, which is, I guess, external engagement, that understanding why your advocates care about you and what makes you distinctive, which means external engagement and competitor analysis and all those sorts of things. So Maddie, you'll remember that we began the project with an extended listening phase. Um, Could you tell us a little bit about the scale and scope and the methodologies employed in that phase? Um, Yes, so we had quite an extensive um, exercise. We had 71 hour qualitative face to face interviews with a range of different audiences. Corporates were very important, obviously alumni, students, staff. Um, In fact, we could have done three times as many as that, Um, but that's what we had the budget to do. Um, We invited every student to engage in a a qualitative online survey. 80 members of my own team were surveyed and uh, put their pennyworth in, because many of them had actually lived with this for years, and, um, and, and they'd lived with all the painful things that weren't right. Um, We asked questions like, how do our audience see us? Um, How do we compare with our competitors? What space should we be inhabiting in the market? And how should we be communicating? We try to keep the questions relatively straightforward, actually. 
And what we were after there was to draw almost a mental map of the competitive environment that your stakeholders, your partners, your staff, your students had in their heads. So rather than it being a desk-based exercise, which can be quite abstract and not always give you a real idea of what the world is thinking, we were only interested in drawing the maps inside people's heads, which gave us some quite different answers. And then the, mi the main findings of the research phase. Yeah, um, in many ways this wasn't surprising to us because in our earlier sort of navel gazing we'd, we'd come up with these things that were important to us and, and really this exercise confirmed that, um, gave us a lot of confidence. One of the key findings was that we were very much less confident as a university internally than our stakeholders were with us externally and that was a huge sobering moment actually that we had to really take the initiative and step forward and be brave about it. But what we found was that, this is Ollie's phrase actually that, that we've kind of picked up on, more Edison than Einstein. Um, I'm not going to take credit for that actually, it was one of your senior execs. Oh was it? Yeah it was. Oh yeah. which yeah. one? Never mind. I can't remember. Um, that we're about applied very real world research, that's very important to us. We're very, very close to industry, um, exclusively postgraduate. Um, and our work is very concept to delivery, so whilst we do do blue sky research, actually we take more pride in taking the research we do through to development and um, delivering something that the client or the customer actually uses on the shop floor. So we're very practical in that sense. And we have some unique technical facilities, near industrial facilities, at our 300 acre site. Um, I think the other thing that's just worth mentioning is we are distinctive because we have our own airport. And, um, <laughs> you know, we were not really talking about that too much. So there was all this stuff that needed to be unearthed, stories that could be told, and there were some absolutely fantastic stories. I'm just going to mention one that I remember distinctly. There was a Virgin Pendolino crash a little while back, and Cranfield has that crashed train in a warehouse, and they use it um, to look at uh, yeah, the, the science of analysing accidents. And there was a, a lady whose mother had died in that crash, and she was really concerned that the woman had had a slow and horribly painful death and Cranfield were able to <clears throat> model the last seconds of what would have happened in the carriage where she was sitting and reassure this woman that the death was instantaneous. Now that's really miserable isn't it but how powerful and there were these sorts of stories that we kept hearing from different people, you know, that, that people would bring Formula One cars and crash test them in a warehouse over there but it was top secret and you couldn't go inside it. Um, that there was a, a huge Airbus that would, not an Airbus, uh, I can't remember what the, the plane was, that would go up and, and read the weather every day that had been donated by British Airways. You know, incredible stories that, that needed to be 737. exposed. A 737, there you go. I'm not a plane nerd, I'm afraid. I do apologise. <laughs> not that you are muddy either. <laughs> okay. okay. So, and then, so those are the main findings. And this phrase, industries, university, was if you like, the summation of everything, we felt like it, you, we could distill you down to those two words. Yeah, that, that was our positioning. And, um, you know, it's not something we use publicly, but it is something that guides our thinking. Yeah. Um, and it's a helpful sieve for us to test think the new things out that we do. Does this fit with our position as industries university? OK, and then I'd love you to say a little bit about, um, we worked with you to develop your brand personality, which you'd already done some super foundational work on, um, and also your tone of voice. So... Tell us a little bit about that and maybe mention your, um, I'd say, very healthy obsession with uh, brand behaviours. Yes, well, none of you will be able to read this, I'm sure, um, but it does show the kind of detailed work that we did, thinking about what was important to us. Um, if we talked about that confidence, we, we needed to be confident and influential, um, confident and ambitious, expert and influential, relevant and challenging, and these are all things that we had to really think about in terms of the language that we started to use in the way that we communicate with our audiences. And actually, many of our key messages have been through a filter of thinking about these things. Are these key messages actually conveying these behaviours at all or not? Um, so there was, uh, there was a, it was an important foundational piece of work where we thought, OK, this is the way we communicate to the outside world, but how about the way we behave internally? And um, we did do something that was quite powerful in that we, we took some of these phrases and we tested them out with internal folks and we put them on great big posters and we 
um, put them on massive boards, actually, right around the campus. And we didn't comment on them at all. We just didn't make a mention. They were very brightly coloured. And it was quite interesting to see the curiosity that people had around the campus to what these meant. And gradually, gradually, we began to explain that these were the sorts of values that were surfacing from the research work that were important to us. And quite quickly, you could hear people inside the organisation using these. Oh, we can't do that. That's not very innovative and enterprising. Or, yeah, we're agile and responsive, so we'll do that. And it's funny how quickly it became part of our behaviour, which is the thing that I was a bit anal about, I have to say. Because for me, a brand is the brand experience, not the pictures. I mean, that's a symbol for the brand that you have, but the brand experience is absolutely everything. It's the promise that you're making to everybody who touches your organisation. And you've got to convey that through every single touch point, whether that's a personal interaction or a learning experience or a bit of collateral. And I can't agree with that enough. I think it's really interesting we've shown you loads of work already, and this is all entirely pre-visual identity but some real behaviour changing, organisation shaping work that was going on at this point. Okay, so principle three, be confident and be prepared. We've already heard a few horror stories at the beginning of the presentation, university rebrands that have gone wrong, either at the point of launch or even sometimes before the point of launch. Could you tell us a bit about how you handled the preparations for launch at Cranfield? Well, building on the, um, the bit of work I've just told you where we shared things inside, we spent months and months doing this, actually. Um, we had a great many consultation exercises inside. In fact, people got a bit bored with the word brand, I have to say. It became something that became a normal thing to talk about, uh, but in the context of behaviour. So one thing we did, for example, was one of the roadshows that we had was I took with me our head of campus services and our head of estate, and they talked about what the brand meant to them, about the way they were building the estate, the way they were delivering their services. We took the director of HR with us, and she was able to talk about the way that our behaviours were influencing the way we worked with our, each other, um, and the sorts of things that we'd be looking at within a PDR. So we did a great, you know, great deal of work on that sort of level. The other thing we did was wanted to be very clear about the reason we'd done it and where it came from. So we did a quick animation that maybe you could show, yeah, Ollie, sure. which um, was important to make sure that we were consistent. We were very concerned that our alumni and our students understood the background to this and they didn't sort of see it as a kind of hadn't really thought about it quick thing. And so we put this on the web and we showed it around internally, if you've got it there. Yeah, sure. So um, just to say, IE can't take any credit for this. I don't want to give you the impression that it's ours, but we did help with the, the script. Cranfield. From RAF base to postgraduate university, we've always embraced change. We have a history of success, but now our market is very competitive and global. To meet these new challenges we must work closely together, be more ambitious and make our distinctive mark in the world. In 2015 we asked ourselves how ready we are for a brave and exciting new future. We asked you, our stakeholders, to help us. We asked what makes Cranfield special? And you told us it was our relevant and practical research, taking ideas from concept to delivery, our closeness to industry, a world-class executive education, our exclusively postgraduate offering, and our distinctive people and facilities that makes us industry's university. You told us we're in great company, competing with the best in the world. What you told us has helped us to shape our future. We redefined our purpose, we are creating leaders in technology and management. We identified our personality and agreed the way we should work together and with our customers. We reviewed all the brand names we use. We've made it easier to share the great work we do by using fewer stronger logos that highlight our collective strengths and how they are all connected. We took our inspiration from our roots and produced a new, clearer identity that really conveys the essence of Cranfield. A mark of distinction, the perfect symbol for a global brand. 
It's a window through which we show the rich difference we make to the world's grand challenges. The work we do is sector-facing. Our institutional crest continues to mark our formal university role, our past and our future, working together. So Cranfield begins 2016 with a bold and distinctive identity built on our special story. The story you have helped to write. Okay, so, and we were ready, obviously, for the, that looks like the copyright symbol, that looks like the logo from Comedy Central, all of that sort of thing, um, because actually there is no new symbol in the world, and um, we decided we like this one, so we stuck with it. I think to say as well, we loved the copyright idea because actually it denoted a sense of there's something of value in here, something we want to protect. No, we beg to differ. Oh, uh, go on. <laughs> Okay, so the next one, we've got a second video, which is longer, so we've only got the, the back end of it, but it gives you a sense of the themes and how it started to unpack. Yeah, and the point of, of showing this to you really is that um, this was an important part of managing the story internally because we really had to show what all this stuff we were talking about, behaviours and all the rest of it was for and where it was leading to our own people. So videos were very important because it really painted the vision. It showed people how we could look and how we could go out very confidently. So yes, what you're going to see here is a little section at the end of a much longer video. And then we did versions of these for each one of our themes, but it gives you a flavour of, of what the style, if you like, that we adopted going out. I Last think, question then, Maddie. I think the, la the, the, thing, the thing to say was that on day one, it was uh, July the 4th, I think, that we went out. Nothing changed. That was our launch day. And actually, everybody was expecting lots of fanfare. And actually, there was nothing different that day. We just slid it out quite quietly. And all we really did was put a video on our front page. I mean, obviously, we had done a new website to showcase our new brand. But we were very quiet about it. We didn't really want to make our brand... Um, refresh the story. The story was about our ambition as a university and very much the brand was the vehicle so we didn't particularly want to focus on that. That's great and I think that approach is a fantastic one, a very sensible one where you celebrate the institution and its history and its milestones and the behaviours of its students and its alumni.